current, currently, we have a key word for Chinese economy, which is new normal, meaning current days, China's economy is very different from before because the growth has slowed down. In the past, we talk about this problem from a macroeconomic point of view. Today, we want to talk about new normal from a microeconomic point of view. We are very delighted and honored to have five excellent panelists today with us. I would like to present them first. First, Mr. Shi Wen Chao, President of China Union Pay. Mr. Zhang from a chairman and CEO of City Capital, Zhang Fang You, Guangzhou Automobile uh, Industry Group, Mr. Rubini, Professor of Economics from Stern School of Business, New York, and finally, Mr. Zhang Yichen, and uh, Mr. Zhang Weiying, Professor of Economics from Beijing University. Welcome. So I'd like to ask each of you different questions, and I'd like to hear your reply one by one. First question I'd like to ask Mr. Zhang Weiying. Professor Zhang, you have been studying companies and enterprises in China, so I'd like to ask you the following question. Now, enterprises and entrepreneurs are they having a good, better life under the new normal econo economy? Whether it's new normal or old normal in China, e economy should be developed based on entrepreneurship and not on government subsidies. And what's different now under new normal? Actually, in the past, past 30 years, Entrepreneurs earn money by arbitrage, taking advantage of imbalances of the Chinese economy in the past. And now, under the new normal, we need innovative entrepreneurs who can create value, who can create what customers need today, instead of just taking advantage of imbalances in the economy. In the past, uh, entrepreneurs only l looked at short term, but today, under the new normal, entrepreneurs should have a longer term point of view. Like in a time span of five, 10, even 20 years. So entrepreneurs today have to pay attention to system and institutions. So we really have to have a stable economic institution and system so that entrepreneurs can continue or initiate their innovation in the current economy. Currently, we've seen that there are still some imperfections in Chinese economy. For example, the protection of IPR is still not perfect. So if rule of law in the financial and economic sectors cannot be uh, protected, it's very difficult for entrepreneurs to change, to transform into a more innovative pattern of development under the new normal. Many people think we should rely only on government policies. I don't think so, because Entrepreneurs know better the economy than the government officials. Policies can, be on, can only depend on known factors, but economy and entrepreneurs should rely on a reliable a rule of law or a reliable and predictable system so that they can continue to innovate. So in terms of difference between private entrepreneurs and state-owned company entrepreneurs. 
I don't think entrepreneurs from SLEs can be called entrepreneurs. Sorry for the uh, president and chairman here. Because entrepreneurs should take risk, take risks. That's why I don't think SLE entrepreneurs are real entrepreneurs because they don't have to take real risks like private entrepreneurs. From my observation, SOE entrepreneurs or SOE uh, chairmen do not have more than three, above three years uh, visibility. That's why they cannot really innovate. Thank you, Mr. Zhang. I meet Mr. Zhang Fangyo every year in Davos, and I know Guangzhou Automobile is faced with many challenges in China under the new normal. So Mr. Zhang Fangyo, I know that you have some joint ventures with foreign stakeholders. So under the new normal, what are the challenges you are facing? And also in China today, manufacturing including car manufacturing is facing challenges, but also opportunities. So I'd like to know, what do you think about the new normal? Thank you, Mrs. Hu. Guangzhou Automobile uh, Group. Maybe some of you don't really know this group, but there are top 10 uh, automobile car groups in China. And Guangzhou Automobile is ranked number five. We have a joint venture with, with Honda or and Toyota, too. We also have a joint venture with Chrysler. We also have our own uh, brands, such as Trenchy or Legend. So you ask me, a group like us who have joint ventures with foreign companies, we, and we also have some state shareholding. So joint venture accounted for 75% of our businesses. So The challenges we are facing are as follows. Because we have joint ventures with foreign companies, so we have, maybe we are more adapted or, be, or we are more able to adapt ourselves to new normal because we have different products and mechanisms. We try to introduce different products and capitals. And based on these, our group and our companies are going through innovation too. I'd like to give you some figures. In, the, in this year, the automobile industry grew by 4%, but we have grown by more than 10%. In 2014, we had a growth rate of 25 percent, and 2013, we had a 45 percent of growth, which may seem exaggerated for you, but it's real growth for us. For us, that's exactly because our products cater to Chinese customers' needs and taste. For example. Last year, our growth rate is much higher than the average growth rate. And we have four different kinds of uh, car models who are actually sold out. Customers can even find them in our dealerships. So they're very well said, sold. So under the new normal, what are your different uh, advantages and disadvantages for you as a group, as a car group? In terms of advantages, our advantages is our products who cater to Chinese customers. And in terms of uh, disadvantages, the overall econo economy grows much slower than the before, so we have to adjust our growth rate too. 
our advantage is, is that now we have our strength of innovation. For example, our brand, Chan Chi, has been enjoying very good uh, sales figure in the car industry. Of course, under the new normal, we are facing some challenges, but we also have very good advantages which are deep rooted already in our company's DNA. So I think we can remain optimistic. Thank you, Mr. Zhang. Now I'd like to ask Mr. Shi. The relation between real economy and financial sector. So I'd like to ask you, Mr. Shi, Chairman of Union Pay, why the liquidities of financial sectors are not coming through into the real economy to help the physical economy. How do you see this problem? Uh, worldwide, or, uh, in the, globally speaking, if uh, in terms of economic cycle, we are seeing that financial sector now is disconnected from the real economy, even more so now than before. In the 80s, I think this started in the 80s, a lot of liquidities remain within the financial sector and do not go through into the real economy. Is it a demand side problem? or a supply side problem? I personally think both. From demand side, China under new normal is changing its economic structure, economical structure. Those who needed money before maybe don't need money now. And now there are new sectors which need liquidity, but these needs are not well known to the financial sectors. Maybe it's a communication channel problem. So financial sector still doesn't know about these new needs. And from supply side, currently financial <coughs> institutions, uh, their old customers are needing less and less liquidity. And financial institutions are trying to quantify, trying to find and quantify the new needs in the current uh, economical situation. That's why we have this this connection between financial sector and real economy. Uh, More on the development of Chinese economy, we could see that it's difficult to encounter a financial crisis. Crisis may not be a better term, a good term, to describe the current situation. For the past 30 years, China was developing at a very fast pace. But for financial professionals, days are getting more difficult. Now we are facing market pressure. My colleague here is from the financial circle. I'm sure he faces much pressure. So, okay, could you reply to this question? What kind of a pressure do you encounter? What are your major difficulties this year? I think I should add one point to my colleague, the separation between real economy and the financial circles. 
I think, because there are many debt enterprises that should be eliminated long ago. If you use the market clearing definition, such enterprises should withdraw from the market long ago, but because they got support from the government and banks are not uh, ready to accept their own failure. That's why they were allowed to survive. Indeed, financial capital is not able to enter the real economy, as my colleague just now has pointed out. As a whole, in terms of investment, everybody knows that we are facing hard times, that we should be very prudent in investment. Everybody is doing short-term operation. That after investing on one field, it's hope that others would follow suit. That's why there was this stock market catastrophe last year, 2015. One journalist told me that after interviewing many Chinese companies, not one of them holds a optimistic view, but none of them is desperate about the Chinese economy. So that I think that this year, the, we cannot underestimate the risk in the financial market. The risk will not be lower than 2015. I think that we are all expecting Professor Rubini to tell us on the imbalance in world economy. Has such imbalance be, be solved? Um, well, uh, I would start saying that, of course, uh, the beginning of the year has been a period of significant turmoil in financial markets, uh, significant correction of US and global equity. Uh, the triggers are many. Uh, first one being uh, concerns again, like in August and September, that China might have a hard landing, and the hard landing of growth might lead to a collapse of the currency and the stock market. Uh, I don't believe China is going to have a hard landing, but the market starts to believe that. Uh, secondly, the U.S. economic data are mixed and weak, uh, the latest ones, and uh, maybe the Fed made a mistake in starting raising uh, interest rates from zero in December. Uh, you have this um, geopolitical risk in the Middle East and the rising conflict between uh, Sunni Saudi Arabia and Shia uh, Iran, and those tensions are affecting markets. You've had this collapse uh, of all prices. Uh, collapse of all prices, if it's driven by a positive uh, supply shock, should be good for the global economy, and instead it seems to be rattling financial markets. Uh, I think for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that maybe is driven not just any longer by a positive supply shock, but also about concerns about uh, aggregate demand globally, weakness of growth in China, weakness of growth in uh, emerging markets, weakness of growth in the United States. So if the fall in oil prices are reflecting weak global growth, is bad news about the global economy. That's one of the factors explaining it. Uh, we also have uh, concerns about what's going on in Europe, the migration crisis, uh, terrorism, the risk of Greek exit from the Eurozone, the risk of British exit from the European Union, austerity and reform fatigue in the periphery of the Eurozone, bailout fatigue in the core of the Eurozone. People already started to worry about disintegration and balkanization of Europe and the Eurozone. Uh, we have now stresses in uh, credit markets where uh, high leverage uh, companies in oil, energy, but other sectors are now subject to significant stress in the United States and other parts of the world. And uh, after years in which revenues and profits of corporations have been growing very robustly right now, there's a bit of a slump in, in US and global earnings and top line and bottom line. So I think it's like a perfect storm of all these things happening. Now in the specifics of China, 
uh, I would say the following thing. Uh, markets tend to be manic depressive, uh, go from excessive optimism to excessive pessimism. In uh, a year ago, they were believing in this rhetoric of the Chinese government that China could achieve a soft landing, they could maintain growth at 7%, that the Chinese were a bunch of uh, super heroic technocrats who couldn't do any, any, any wrong. And now they've gone to the other extreme of saying uh, the policymakers are incompetent, they cannot stabilize growth, the currency, the stock market, they're lying and cheating. Growth is not seven, not even six, it's uh, four going to zero. We'll have a hard landing, it's gonna lead to a collapse of uh, stock market and the currency. And my view for the last few years on China has been uh, neither a soft landing or a hard landing. I always say China's gonna have a, a bumpy landing or a rough landing. If I had to give you an estimate, I would say growth this year is not gonna be seven, it's gonna be somewhere in the low 6%. That is a bumpy landing. And eventually, by the end of this decade, potential growth in China is not more than 5%. So the good news is that if China is gonna have a bumpy landing, at some point the markets are gonna calm down and they're gonna not worry about the collapse of the currency in the stock market. And that's the positive, but it's gonna take time because until now the data are negative and people are overreacting to what's going on in China. And until things stabilize and there is more policy action, the PBOC will have to do additional rounds of easing uh, you have to use fiscal policy at the central level to boost aggregate demand. You have to do a variety of structural reform to boost economic growth. And those things are gonna take time. But on the negative, I would say, there is the fact that the Chinese are sticking with this objective of maintaining growth at six and a half to 7% when potential is going towards five. And the only way to do so is to do new rounds of credit fuel fixed investment that imply more bad debts, more bad assets, more bad investments from commercial to residential real estate, to infrastructure, to excess capacity, industrial and manufacturing sector, where with the steel or cement or aluminum, glass plates, and many other sectors, there is excess capacity. And there is not a willingness to shut down those firms and factories that have this excess capacity. And therefore, I worry that right now, because of political arguments, they need to double GDP within the decade is a political goal. Uh, people are emphasizing again, maximizing growth as opposed to the rebalancing of growth from capital intensive, resource oriented, export and capex towards uh, more consumption, consumption of services and labor intensive growth. That rebalancing is more rhetoric than actual and therefore there's an attempt to kick the can down the road that implies more debts, more bad assets, more bad investments and eventually that could slow down the economy more than otherwise. So the good news is not a hard landing, the bad news is that uh, the policymaker seems to be not willing to do some of the necessary adjustments that are necessary to lead to that rebalancing of growth in a more sustainable and balanced way. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, okay, um, the Chinese arrogance. Right. You ask about the currency? Yes. Um, you know, there is a concern that China is going to let its the currency depreciate sharply. Uh, I, think, I don't think that's going to be the case. It's not going to be the case because net exports in China actually are rising. The current account surplus is rising. Uh, actual export growth is doing okay on a sequential basis. Uh, you know, the six, seven million college graduates in China don't want to go and assemble T-shirts or even iPhones in factories. They want service jobs, and for that one, you need to have a stronger currency, not a weaker currency. Uh, right now, China currency is member of the SDR. This is an exclusive club with rights, also come responsibilities. If China were to depreciate by say X percent, five or 10 currencies in emerging markets are gonna fall by two X or three X. That's gonna lead to rising inflation. It's gonna lead to a sharp increase in the real dollar value in local currency over their debts. It's gonna lead to financial crisis in emerging markets. And the Chinese say, we're being responsible stakeholder of the global economy. We did not let our currency depreciate during the Asia financial crisis. We didn't let our currency depreciate during the global financial crisis. And now being a member of the SDR, we have to be responsible stakeholders. And therefore, um, the Chinese currency has to weaken in the sense that if you track the US dollar, and the dollar might appreciate as the Fed exits zero policy rates, the dollar might strengthen relative to Euro, the Yen, uh, commodity currencies, emerging markets, and therefore Chinese currency has to depreciate gradually relative to the US dollar. The problem is that when you move your currency by 1% in China, 
people fear the worst and they say it's going to be 5, 10, 15 percent. Why? Because the Chinese currency policy is not transparent. They want discretion of doing what they want, but effectively then they have to intervene to maintain stability with the US dollar, because otherwise people believe there's going to be the worst, and then the capital flight accelerates, that tightens domestic financial condition. I think the way out for China will be to move to a formal basket peg in which the weight of the dollar, euro, or yen, emerging market currency is given. So if the dollar goes up, say, by 5% relative to euro and yen, then the Chinese currency can depreciate based on that weight by, say, 2% relative to the US dollar. And people know that 2% is 2%. is not going to be 5, 10, or 15. But since the Chinese so far, they want to have discretion rather than stick to this rule, uh, then there is no <coughs> transparency, and people expect the worst out of China. And of course, making moves on the currency at a time where there is concerns about growth, and concerns about the stock market, like it happened in August and happened again uh, earlier this month, leads to an exacerbation of those market volatility. So I think the Chinese, both on monetary policy, on exchange rate policy, on the stock market, have to move gradually to a more transparent and open sets of rules so that people can track what they're doing in a credible way. Got it. Thank you very much. Very impressive. Uh, Mr. Zhang Weiyin, one question. The government is appealing for innovation. If I were a young man, youngster, what proposal, what advice would you give me? I'm sorry, I cannot give such an advice because it has been said that innovation cannot be predicted. If government officials could give such predictions to entrepreneurs, these officials themselves should become an entrepreneur. I'm not in agreement with the concept that government should give subsidy to companies and enterprises. What governments should do is to provide a level field for competition then the success and failure depends, relies on the entrepreneur's perception of the market. Now people are discussing what sector should the government encourage or provide support. We see that such thinking has led to failure in the past, or there will be an overcapacity as you have seen in the past. For example, uh, solar panels is a, is a classic example. Thank you. But I would like to ask another question, that governments should not uh, issue too many uh, policies, industrial policies. But what do you think? What are the sectors that are more promising in the future? But I cannot predict for the future that successful enterprises nowadays were not foreseen 20, 30 years ago. In 1990, Bill Gates himself did not have a very good opinion on the development of internet. Internet later found an extra extraordinary growth. Entrepreneur needs freedom. They don't need anything else. Zhang Yucheng, let's come back to the stock exchange, because Zhang Weiyin has explained on the innovation. If you have uh, money at hand, would you invest on Chinese stock market? Would you change your renminbi into US dollars? For me, stock markets in China I mean, you can find three different uh, stock markets in one stock market in China. For example, blue chip board, which is the main board. Its valuation currently is is not that high now. For example, there are many big banks or many big telecommunication or petroleum uh, companies, such as uh, such as China Steel, et cetera, et cetera, their P-E ratio is only 12 times. It's not that expensive. 
And another board for uh, SMEs, PE ratio is already 30 to 40 times. And for uh, entrepreneur board, at the end of last year, the PE ratio was 70, 70, and now it's 50 to 60 uh, times. So if you ask me if I want to invest in equities or stock markets, I will invest in blue chip uh, stocks. In terms of its uh, dividends yield, it's already 5 or 6 percent, which is not that bad in terms of return. But for a startup board, you have to be very careful because, of course, there are good startups, but most of them maybe will disappear in 10 years. And in terms of exchange rate, I don't think there will be a huge uh, devaluation of renminbi in the future. As Ru Mr. Rubini just said, we have current account surplus, which, are still, which is still very high. And the overall ec economic situation is not bad either. And we have very strong foreign currency reserve. And Chinese government also will save its face. Now that we are already in S SDR, uh, as an, we are already in SDR uh, currency. PBOC said they were pegged to a group of currencies, not only to uh, U.S. dollars. If they can give more clearer uh, guidance to the market, I don't think there will be a huge devaluation for renminbi in the future. Mr. Shi, would you want to say something in terms of financial market? Again, stock market issue, uh, renminbi exchange rate issue, P2P issue, or def uh, some uh, pansy schemes in China. How do you look at these Chinese financial problems? So today, you want us to talk about new normal. Actually, I don't really understand new normal. What's new normal? Do you mean the normality in the new era or new normal in a different era or in the current era? Do you mean ordinary state of uh, ordinary uh, condition or regular condition or normal condition? What do you mean by new normal, actually? Do you mean? We have to think all think of this in uh, from uh, com in terms of common sense. If we judge all this from common sense, I think we should believe in common sense. There um, is one stock in stock market in Chinese stock market, which is called P two B, P two B. And actually, this company changed its name. And then their stock increased for 10 days. So we really have to start from a common sense. If anything which, is not, which, which does not follow the normal or regular rules of things, or rule of thumb, we should not believe in it. Mr. Zhang, many of you talked about dead companies or zombie companies. So Mr. Zhang Fang Yo, we know that Guangzhou uh, Automobile Group has been doing very well. But do you think there is indeed a excess capacity in China? How to reduce overcapacity in China? Actually, we indeed have overcapacity in manufacturing in China. That's why government has adopted different policies to reduce uh, overcapacity. 
So we have to follow uh, what central government wants to do. So we have to reduce overcapacity, which is a reality. But I think it's a uh, the overcapacity can have a uh, cyclical and a structural aspect. If it's a structural overcapacity, which means we have too much capacity, too much of idle capacity. So for car industry, even last year, there was a 4% of growth in car industry. This means if you have good products, you can still sell your cars. You can still use your capacity. But if you don't have good products or your costs are too high, then you cannot sell cars. Then you have overcapacity. I think the same issue exists in other industries too. There are, there is indeed structural overcapacity in other uh, industries. How do you reduce idle or useless capacity and increase the usage of useful, so-called useful capacity? This is what Chinese companies have to do now. For example, uh, telecommunications or mobile phone producers they also have to face this uh, overcapacity issue. Now, Chinese economy has been slowing down. This will also uh, f as this was also require companies to reduce their overcapacity. In other words, to better use your capacity and reduce your idle or useless capacity. Different cities and different uh, regional governments have been issuing uh, policies and adopted measures to reduce um, overcapacity. For example, they merge different companies so as to reduce capacity without causing instabilities in different areas and different cities. This is very important. Thank you. Professor Rubini, I'd like to hear you about supply side reform. What do you look at supply side reform from an American point of view, supply side reform? Can you give us some insights? And then I will ask Mr. Zhang, Professor Zhang to follow up. Um, yeah, I think that China, like uh, other parts of the world, uh, needs, uh, call them supply side reforms or structural reforms uh, to rebalance its own economy. Uh, I think that three or four of them probably are key. The first one, as was pointed out by many other the panelists, is there is now a significant amount of excess capacity in industry manufacturing, steel, cement, aluminum, glass plates, you know, even the auto sector. You know, in China, I think there are, what, 100 different auto automakers. You know, in the U.S., you have three. So the auto industry in China today looks like the U.S. 100 years ago. So massive consolidation has to occur. And in many other sectors of manufacturing, there's excess capacity. Uh, the reality, to do so, you have essentially to decide that you're going to shut down some state-owned enterprises or shut down some factories. And of course, that uh, on a transitory basis implies a rise in unemployment. Some people will have to leave <clears throat> individual firms, individual sectors, individual cities and regions, and gradually move to the new industries of the future. Many of them are going to be in the service sector. And I don't think that the employment problem is going to be in the medium term a severe one, because even with growth rates, say, potentially of 5%, first of all, there is aging of population, so there is less labor supply. And the service sector tends to be much more labor intensive than capital intensive industry. And therefore, once the rebalancing of growth has occurred, China can maintain social stability and near full employment, even with a growth rate of 5%. But politically, I think the nervousness is that if you shut down thousands of these firms and SOEs, like uh, 
uh, Premier Zhurongji did uh, over a decade ago, there'll be transitional unemployment rate, and that's going to lead to instability. Now, the solution to that problem is a second piece of structural reform, is to have the right types of fiscal policies. Uh, today in China, every time there is a slowdown of growth, uh, the fiscal stimulus takes the form of another round of credit-fueled fixed investment that implies <clears throat> more bad investments, more bad assets, more bad debts. What China instead needs is uh, to have a fiscal policy where you're building a social safety net. If people have unemployment benefits, if they have paid health care, if they have pensions, if they have ways of getting reskilled as they lose jobs in some sectors and have to move to another one, if people can be allowed to move from one city to another and not having issues of migrant workers and registration, that readjustment will occur and you'll have a safety net so that people are going to accept that and the political and social instability is going to be constrained. So you need a second pillar of it, a structural fiscal reform. And the third one is that the allocation of savings and investment and of credit has been driven by politics because most of the financial system were state-owned enterprises and you have to have a better and more efficient allocation of uh, saving to investments, not to the state-owned enterprise that's been subsidized, but all to the private sector, because the private sector is going to be the one, especially small and medium-sized enterprises, startups are going to be creating the new jobs of the future in the industries of the future, tech, innovation, services, and so on. But that implies that then you have to stop the moral hazard of bailing out everybody. You have to allow some financial institutions to fail. You have to allow some borrowers to fail and therefore impose some degree of market discipline that's going to force then those in the private and public sector, so is or otherwise, to adjust uh, operationally and financially. So you need SOE reforms, you need the fiscal reform, you need financial sector reforms, and then if you do it in a coherent way, there will be transitional costs, but they're going to be achievable. And you also need a reform of the system of registration to allow people to move from where the jobs are declining to where the new jobs are going to be. So those are the four key reforms to be made. However, the imperative of maintaining growth closer to 7% means that China is doing all these reforms more slowly than is optimal and desirable. They tend to kick the can down the road rather than doing it more front-loaded. But, but kicking the can down the road, you're creating a bigger financial problem down the line. So the question is, at which point uh, President Xi, having cracked down on corruption, have established his own control on the major uh, political and economic power is going to feel like it can front load some of those economic reforms. The sooner they're done, the better it's going to be. The later they are done, the greater the risk of a harder landing, I would say. Okay. Uh, Wei Ying, do you have anything to add to this economic reform? Professor Zhang, supply side reforms, as Mr. Rubini just said, should should not come from uh, NDRC or central government. As we just said, overcapacity is due to companies which cannot produce what consumers want. So in order to solve this issue, we have to let some companies die or disappear, like zombie companies. For example, some SOEs should let them fail in, in the steel industry. That's exactly the case. Uh, S SOEs are not shut down, but private steel companies are shut down or did not uh, receive help. So we have to let the market play a bigger role. Thank you. So, OK. First, I come from the young global leader. I would like to ask President Shi. Everybody was talking of supply side reform. That all of you said that the risk would be greater. In 2016, this is not conducive to innovation against such background. How would you lead innovation work? Everybody will have a turn to speak. Supply side reform, I think there are two levels. One on the macro 
policy, the other on the micro level. For the macro side, the current uh, reform centers on reductions of uh, taxes and the Thatcherian uh, policy. From the micro policy, I am in much agreement with uh, Professor Tang. Entrepreneurs' perception of the market is important for supply. They don't need outside uh, advice or help under such circumstances. How do we look at this supply side reform? I think is if you could do my macro reform, then go ahead. But at the micro level, then leave, leave the reform to us, for me, on financial risk. I think in the past year, in general, government ministries are over-stressing on innovation, especially for the financial sector. In China, it's not a market-oriented uh, financial circle. It's difficult to undertake uh, reform. It would increase the risk. I think that the tempo on this reform should be lowered a bit, at least for the time being. Secondly, what we should do on the financial market, a multi-tier financial market, for example, government support is uh, not that strong. There's not yet a bond market that we have more than 10 years of experience in such reform on the bond market, on the equity market, apart from improving the performance of equity market on the PE bonds, you should do a reform that should be sufficient to promote the growth of the stock market. For the equity market, we should not overemphasize on such on certain forms of trading. I think this is too risky and too early for China. Is there any other questions from the audience? I'm a journalist from uh, JIC, and I will ask Professor Zhang from last summer, financial markets are undergoing turmoil. Public authorities have undertaken policies. Such turmoil has continued this year. What do you think the supervisory bodies should uh, do, in other words, Apple Pay has been introduced into China. China Union Pay is progressing steadily, and such introduction into, into China isn't a bit late at this time. Uh, we could you shorten your reply? Okay, simply put, I think the biggest lesson from the equity market is that government has overdone its job. Too much intervention from the public authorities. Government would think of using equity market to balance the Chinese economy, then if it doesn't work, then government would intervene in buying stocks. That would not lead to a healthy development 
of the stock market. For healthy development, government should withdraw from this market and leave the market to professionals. Government should only set basic fundamental policy. That's all. Wen Chao, what do you think? In the beginning, the negotiations were difficult for bank cards, whether for Visa or Master. We stake on one principle. Apples, as a handset uh, producer, it's pr pr uh, providing intermediate product. The Apple company doesn't take part in sharing the benefits. Now, Apple has put forward such a request. The foresight agreement has been in practice for many years. Nobody has ever asked to share the profit. In fact, we are helping Apple to sell your handsets. So you shouldn't charge more fees so that the banks give it the name, calling it an Apple's fee. This is a breakthrough of the traditional model. Your question on whether Apple has come too late, I think it all depends on how you look at it. How late is too late? If it's too late, then we will do nothing at all. Apple doesn't believe that it has come too late. OK, last question from you, please. A short question, one sentence, then we'll give you a very brief reply. Well, Rubini, um, um, thank you for, for talking about the maniacal depressive markets. But we also know communication is about who receives, but also who sends it. And obviously, there's a consensus that the communication from a Chinese government side needs to be improved on explaining. What would be your recommendation, given the Chinese system? How can we have a Chinese government of the central bank be probably as subtle when he speaks as Janet Lennon or Mario Draghi? What would be your advice, maybe on the other panelists, on how the, the Chinese strategy and policy is better explained? Because what I realize, especially here, is that there is a big, big, big uncertainty which creates fear. Um, I, I do agree with you that uh, it's a problem, both communication and also transparency. Uh, for example, uh, there is not transparency about the GDP number, and that's why uh, people don't believe those numbers. And the uh, Chinese can do more to adhere to the international standards that, say, the IMF is imposing on revealing more data about your economic and financial conditions. Uh, secondly, I think that the transition to a more flexible exchange regime uh, uh, was botched, was not communicated properly. Uh, effectively, China should be moving to a basket peg, but if you don't have an explicit basket peg that says this is the weight of the US dollar and this is the weight of other currencies, then when the Chinese currency moves by 1%, 2%, people believe this is the beginning of 5, 10, 15, and that leads to the acceleration of uh, capital flight and then need to intervene to stop it and capital control and you get a mixed signal. And the same thing for the stock market. Unfortunately, the Chinese fed the, the stock market bubble because after the, uh, the real estate market uh, bubble went bust, uh, Chinese savers were earning uh, negative returns on their deposits. Then they went into the shadow banks. So they were giving them high return. Then they cracked down on the shadow banks. Uh, given capital control, they cannot invest in foreign assets. So the Chinese started feeding uh, an equity bubble by allowing uh, borrowing at the margin. And millions of people started to go and borrow and join brokerages. And that created that bubble. And that bubble went bust. And once it went bust, for a while they were not doing anything. Then they started intervening. Then they stopped intervening. Then they introduced circuit breakers that are not designed properly. And therefore, both the design of the policies and the communication of policies has been uh, messy at best. 
So I think it's a bit of a learning experience, learning about how market reacts, learning about being more clean in communication, being more transparent on the data, and hopefully slowly, slowly that's going to occur, but certainly uh, there is a lack of credibility, there is a lack of transparency, and there is this issue about uh, communicating properly what you're doing. I think that's a challenge that the Chinese uh, will have to face. Okay. Uh, now we have uh, no more time. Now we allow panelists in one sentence to describe what are the challenges you are facing now. Mr. Tang, give you five seconds to talk on this topic. The economy. Well, no, just one term, not one phrase. Give it. Huh? And to see progress in difficulties. And Yu Cheng, risk. Wen Chang. Well, I will uh, remain immobile. Now, more instability. Uh, Professor Rubini, what would you, uh, what, what, what term would you give to sum up the current situation? Stop uh, kicking the can down the road and be serious about structural reforms and about rebalancing, because the more you wait, the, the bigger the problem is going to become. Okay, thank you very much. Uh,